All right. Hello, Jay. Thanks for coming on. How are you doing today? Good. Thanks for having me on, Chris. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you were kind enough to send me an early copy of The Power of Us. I binged it, loved it. And so the first thing I want to ask you is, I'll preface it like this. I read a ton of books on this topic and just, you know, I got really interested in like group psychology and how we interact in groups. And with that being said, with so many books I read, like you guys, your book was totally unique. And I think you guys saw that there was maybe a gap that needed to be filled with these books. So can you kind of explain like what inspired this book and what you guys tried to do differently with it to discuss this broader topic? Yeah, thanks for asking. And thanks for noticing that. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's one of the things So we read a ton of books too, um, maybe not as many as you, but one of the things that we come across repeatedly in books and in, in kind of journalistic treatments of group dynamics is that people are becoming aware of identity and how important it is. But they have a very uh, kind of narrow conception of it, which is that it just triggers tribalism, that there's just this us versus them mindset and that we're kind of inevitably going to arrive at that, you know, no mm -hmm. matter what the situation is and distrust and dislike outsiders and always uh, trust and, and like insiders. And what we wanted to do is kind of dig a bit deeper and show that that's not always the case. In fact, that's part of our psychology, but then once you identify with the group, how you act in the group is determined by things like the norms mm -hmm. and how leaders act. And they can uh, create groups that do the exact opposite of what we might predict, that they can create inclusive groups that embrace difference. They can create groups that embrace dissent. In fact, we try to shatter a bunch of myths in our book. And, an, yeah. and yet another myth we try to shatter is that there's this notion that if you dissent, you know, you're either with us or against us. If you're dissenting, it means you side with the other team. Um, what our research shows, specifically Dominic's research, is that the people who are willing to dissent are the people who care about the group the most. Mm. Because dissent is actually really hard and, and you can be socially ostracized by it. And so it's only if you really care about where the group's going and you see it going on a bad path that you're willing to stick your neck out there to try to convince people that things are going wrong and to fix things. So that's yeah. the key uh, lesson of our book is really to kind of shatter a lot of these myths of identity and also... It, once you give people an understanding of it, hopefully you give them the tools to push back and change things and to opt into identities that, mm -hmm. are, that are healthier and, and kind of promote better things in the world. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's something that I've noticed too. So basically I got into this whole, uh, this whole just trying to understand groups because in 2019, uh, I had thousands of complete strangers on the internet coming after me, right? And I'm like, what the hell is happening, you know? And I noticed this and I, uh, one of the things that happened to me immediately was the first person to defend me, everybody went after them, right? And I noticed what makes dissent so hard. Uh, this morning, I actually saw a journalist talking about this with kind of the, uh, the situation in Afghanistan and the conversations around Biden and his, you know, what he did and all that. And I think 99% of uh, conversations are very nuanced. But uh, I guess what I'm asking, have you noticed this like very like black and white thinking when it comes to these group identities, like you're with us or against us, and it's difficult in the middle, because something we know is when you're when you're pushed out of the group, like we're, we're like evolutionary designed to like, be like, this sucks. So we stay quiet. Right. So, so have you kind of noticed the black and white thinking of a lot of people within these groups? Yeah. So, so one thing is that certain types of groups promote black and white thinking. Um, mm. and, and I think that is very, as a scientist, I think that's uh, a dangerous way of thinking because, um, most things are nuanced and have shades of gray and the evidence is pretty complex and there's multiple perspectives. Um, the reason that happens is when groups not only have a sense of identity, but that identity gets tinged with morality, mm. then you really have uh, thinking that shifts into black and white. And, and then it's anybody who disagrees with us is bad under those conditions. And that's where it becomes really uh, difficult or dangerous for a dissenter to speak up because then they are sort of be seen as a heretic. Yeah. We, we, uh, you know, you can do a brief look through human history to see how heretics are treated. And so that is a, a, a point at which you know that the group has gone in a toxic direction usually when you see that type of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing that you have with the dynamics of social media now is that it's very easy to signal your group loyalties and, and to signal uh -huh. your values and that you're a righteous, virtuous person. And so the incentive structure, and this is research that I've done in my lab uh, led by Billy Brady, is when people use moral and emotional language, it gets shared more on social media, mm -hmm. especially on uh, platforms like Twitter. And so it also, it, 
because of the algorithms and the reinforcement structures and the norms of those platforms, people have an incentive, even if they're kind of like actually have a nuanced view of something, is to take a really overly strong moralistic view. And that, that's where all the rewards are. That's what makes their, their messages go viral. And so, of course, that might be fine for some issues, but a lot of times there's collateral damage and people who are getting piled on, you know, especially if it's disproportionate to whatever their sin is, or based now what we see is enormous amounts of misinformation and, and conspiracy theories and, and fake news, mm -hmm. um, then, then it can become a really toxic environment if people are piling on somebody and harassing them uh, for that reason. Yeah, yeah. And and yeah, actually, in a minute, I want to dive deep into that, because the other topic I got really into when all this stuff, you know, happened to me, and I noticed it in politics was, was moral psychology and moral philosophy, because I noticed that that was like, this fuel on the fire. And you mentioned signaling, and people like, here's my group, here's the moral stance that my group takes, and here's what I'm going to amplify. So but before we we touch on that, I kind of for those who don't know, because I read about this all the time, and I'm trying to get better about this is like, I want, I want to kind of like go over like the basics and some of the major findings. So one of the core ideas of your book and when I got sucked in was when you talked about, uh, I think I always screw the name up, but the, uh, the like minimum group paradigm. Is, is it minimum group paradigm? Min minimal group paradigm, yeah. All right, cool, close. I was close. <laughs> All right, so when I came across that research and found like the different ways they kind of like tried it, like with the dot study and, you know, like estimating, I was blown away. I'm like, everybody needs to know this. We need to start from this place and understand how trivial this is. But anyways, can you kind of explain what the minimal group paradigm shows us? And what, and like, do you think it's as important? Because you guys put it in early part of your book. Like, why is that so important to understanding kind of the, the broader conversations? So 50 years ago this year, uh, I think one of the most important studies in the history of social sciences was published by Henri Tajfal and his colleagues at Bristol University in the United Kingdom. And what they did is they were trying to find what are the causal factors that trigger intergroup conflict and discrimination. The problem they had is that when you look around the world to try to study this, the groups that are in conflict often have you know, strong stereotypes about one another, mm -hmm. they're fighting over you know, scarce resources or sacred land. And so it's really hard to figure out, you know, what is driving the actual discrimination. It could be any of those things. And so they decided to strip all that away and, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, scientists in chemistry and other fields create a vacuum to study like, uh, you know, molecules and compounds. And then they were going to add these things in one, one at a time and see what is the key thing that triggers discrimination. Mm -hmm. So this was supposed to be a control condition. And so what they did was they took a bunch of uh, young boys in the original studies and they just basically had them estimate the number of dots in an image, and then they gave them false feedback. They basically flipped the coin and told them either you're an overestimator or an under underestimator. So you tend to overestimate the number of dots on a sheet or underestimate it. In fact, the feedback they gave them had nothing to do with their dot estimation abilities. And, and most people think dot estimation abilities is meaningless anyways, right? Yeah. Um, and so they gave them this feedback, and then they gave them a bunch of options about how to allocate money to other overestimators or underestimators. So in other words, if you were an underestimator, you had a chance to give money to an underestimator, that would be your in-group member, someone like you, or um, the people in the other group would be an out-group member. And what they found repeatedly is that once you flip a coin and put people in groups, even over these totally minimal or arbitrary group distinctions, and again, these are not race, this is not religion, this is yeah. not status, this is dot. It's freaking <laughs> dots. Um, they found that people, easily and readily discriminated. They would give more money to an in-group member than an out-group member. And in fact, they never even met these people or interacted with them or, and they have other studies where, you know, they change what, they make sure that you don't think you'll ever interact with these other people. They have studies where they just flip a coin and you get to see the coin being flipped. Um, I do this in my own classroom. I'll divide my class up into two sides and I'll put them on teams for the class and halfway through the class, I'll give them a little survey and I'll ask how much they like and identify with their team. And every time I've ever done this in my class, people start to identify with their side of the class more, even though they just saw me randomly pick a side, right? Um, and so this is something that's really robust. It's been seen in cultures all over the world. And it really seems like a part of our basic human psychology. And in fact, anthropologists have looked at every single culture on earth and they found that everywhere they looked, uh, people divide themselves into coalitions within groups. And so, and, and fluid coalitions, you know, where the power dynamics change and your coalition can change too. 
And so this just seems to be part of human nature as we identify with coalitions really easy. And, and it was part of our, our way of cooperating and surviving and mm -hmm. uh, fending off predators and you know avoiding being cast out of the tribe and, and dying a lonely death somewhere. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, like <laughs> it's it's dots, right? It's it's like the the key word of all this I, I find is minimal, right? Something so small. So this this transitions into the next piece of uh, you know research that I wanted to discuss. I actually I wrote about it the other day, but it's the IAT, the Implicit Association Test. And this is something that's highly debated. And I've seen the arguments about, you know, the results and everything. But again, going back to what we were talking about, it seems like people see it as very black and white, right? You have one side who's like, look at this, everybody's racist, right? Then the other side is like, look at this, it says no matter what I do, I'm racist. And, and there's a lot of nuance. But basically, you know, with, with the minimal group paradigm, and what we found is we're designed to have these different kind of reactions that we don't even notice, right? So with, with the implicit association test, I, I would love to hear from you, like, what are your thoughts about it as a gauge of, you know, of our biases? And like, do you, do you think that, you know, just the larger conversations that happen around it from just average people are just completely missing the point of it? Like, you know yes. what I mean? <laughs> the IT has become politicized. And so now people view it through the lens of politics rather than what it actually is. So the IT is an interesting and, and quite good, but very flawed measure of the associations we have with different groups. Um, I've used it. I've been using it for almost 20 years in, in studies. And the critiques of it have been known for a long time. So one of the main critiques is it's pretty unreliable for personality measures. So I'll, I'll compare it to like if you take an IQ test and you, you can take it again, you know, two years later, it's very likely you'll have a similar score. Uh, with the IT, you can take it and take it again a year or two years later, or even a month later. And it's not super highly correlated with the score mm, you got at one yeah. minute of time. So it's just not as good of a measure as, as some of the best personality tests we have. Um, but the IT is still measuring something. And if you get large samples of people at the aggregate, it tells you about the associations they have towards certain groups. And so one of the most impressive things about people who developed the IAT is they put it online and got huge data before anybody mm. else was doing online studies and getting mm. huge data. And so they can measure across millions of people degrees of bias. And, and you can link those biases at the group level, so at the county level or state level, to we, we, this is one of the studies we mentioned in our, in our book. It predicts, or sorry, the level of slavery at a county level you know, over 150 years ago, predicts racial bias on the IAT 150 years later with remarkable precision. And so at the aggregate level, once you average across a lot of people, it, it accounts for the fact, once you do that, you kind of rule out all the noisiness of the measurement error and you kind of get better estimates of a group of people or a place. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, I think, the best way that the IAT is, is used is not to treat it as a measure of somebody's individual psychology and use it to assess you know, whether they're deep down a racist or a sexist or something like that, but it's to kind of get a, almost like um, a canary in a coal mine of the broader environment that you're in, the place that you're in, the time frame that you're in, the city that you're in, and kind of get a sense of their overall attitudes or biases. Yeah. And, and yeah, I don't, I don't want to get uh, too political, even though I have a few questions about some of the stuff you guys talk about later in the book, but here's just something like where, where I go insane right? And maybe there's just, you know, the way I, I see it from my own lens. But for example, you have a lot of conversations around like, you know, free speech and open discussions, especially like a great example are the conversations around uh, the, uh, the trans community, right? And, you know, you have these people like, hey, we should at least be able to have the discussion, right? Can we at least talk about rates in children identifying as trans skyrocketing? Like, you know, as a social scientist, like, it's like, hey, Let's, let's at least look into this. Well, anyways, you have a certain group of people, it seems like, who have this argument. But then when it comes to the IAT and stuff, it almost feels like that same group is like, no, that thing's baloney. It's calling me racist. But like you said, it feels like it's just to kind of catch the canary in the coal mine and just be like, hey, hey, I'm not calling you racist, but maybe, maybe in this area or in this group, 
there's something going on that we might want to look at. So, so what are your thoughts on that? Am I crazy or do you kind of see this kind of like selective picking of science and research and conversations we're having? So, so this is, we also have a chapter on this, is that once you're motivated by a political identity, um, you have all kinds of ways of rationalizing your positions on things. Yeah. And, and this can be about whether or not you want to, you know, uh, have a debate over here, but not over here. It turns out, yeah. and this is like uh, one of the things about cancel culture, you know, is cancel culture a left-wing thing? Well, there's research on this. Cancel culture, or basically censoring opinions you don't like, is yeah. basically just driven by people at the extremes of any belief system. They tend to score higher on dogmatism. They think that anything that doesn't agree with them is harmful or morally wrong. And so they want to shut down conversations that don't agree with them. There's very few people who actually principally agree in free speech as a general thing. Yeah. Um, and so this is, unfortunately, that's part of uh, what kind of certain types of extreme identities do is they shut down conversations that are different from them. And, and this is true of the left and true of the, the, the right as well. Yeah. So, so that's when I, whenever I see debates about cancel culture, I'm like, there is cancel culture, but it's not just a left-wing phenomenon. It's just as likely to occur among people on the right, but just for different issues. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what I, I notice, And I I've noticed this. I actually had a uh, Lee McIntyre on here, not, a, not long ago uh, for his book, how to talk to a science denier. And we talked about them like, you know uh, you know, as, as somebody, I feel like I'm, I'm pretty left leaning, but I look at, you know, my side or whatever. I'm like, Hey, there's certain science that you guys just don't want to talk about, but you'll look to them and say, you guys deny global warming. I'm like, I see, I notice a lot of like selective science picking. I'm like, Hey, Hey, like we either believe in the scientific process or we don't, you know, <laughs> like I see that kind of like, you know, we have to, we have to look at all the science and all these things because that's how science progresses and we learn about people. And I, I think at the end of the day, the reason I'm so passionate about that and just kind of trying, trying to be as objective as possible is solutions don't get solved unless we look at it in a, you know, in a true way and have these conversations. So is that something that you guys kind of notice with these kind of like politicized identities around scientific discussions? Yeah, I actually think that politicized identities around scientific discussions is really risky and potentially harmful to science. Like, mm. I, I, so I'll use the IT as a good example is, you know, since about 2002, when I, when I started my PhD, there's been lots of debates about IIT. You know, I've gone to jam-packed rooms at conferences with 300 people where a person will stand up and do a rant criticizing the IIT with, with evidence. And the, all the creators of the IIT are sitting in the front row and they have to listen to it. And then maybe one of them will get up and give a counterpoint. And then the rest of us are all listening to this and trying to see kind of what the evidence is in the middle. And some of us, you know, stopped using the IIT because of it. Others decided it wasn't that bad. Most of us decided on a middle ground, which is like, it's good for these things, but not for these things. So I've mm. actually used IT for some things and other things I wouldn't use it for because it's not as good for those things, right? Understand the limitations. I want to use it, wouldn't use it to assess individuals, but I think it's a reasonable device to assess group attitudes. Mm. And so that's how science is supposed to operate. Um, it's not supposed to operate where there's certain topics that are verboten um, or mm -hmm. that certain critiques are not allowed. Um, as long as the critique is good and based on evidence and rigorous, then it should be allowed in the sphere of discussion. Um, if not, we're, we're, you know, censorship is a, is a risky thing to do in science. Mm -hmm. so, so that's why I really don't like this. Um, and, and, I, and I'll say science is, scientists are human. Um, we, we cherry pick things all the time. There's, but usually what happens with scientists, people often think scientists' politics drive their, their what they publish. We, we've analyzed that and we found very little evidence for it. Um, you know, scientists are largely liberal, but if you look in the literature, the liberal findings that are more liberal are kind of just as strong as the findings that tend to be published that are conservative. Um, mm -hmm. So, so what, what I think scientists are biased at, and this is something that if you ask any scientists behind closed doors, they'll agree, is that some scientists are really committed to their little pet theory um, yeah. or, or belief and, and because that's what gets you social status in the scientific community. Mm -hmm. so your theory and your work gets cited, that gets you a job, that gets you a, a raise, that gets you tenure. Mm -hmm. So the real metrics of success in science, what really gets rewarded is not really your ideology, it's, it's your theoretical precision and your empirical work. And so I think that that's where scientists and, and a lot of research on this have gone wrong. They'll cherry pick certain findings or leave out outliers that don't agree with their, their position or that don't, that, that, that contradict their theory. And so there's all different types of identities we have. 
um, and all different types of biases we have. And that, I think that's one of the big ones that scientists have. And so yeah. that's why we're constantly trying to figure out new ways of rooting out bad practices and forcing people to make their, their data public and stuff like that yeah. so that we can kind of mitigate those things in the scientific community. Um, but I wish, you know, discussions on social media would have ways of mitigating misinformation and bad evidence too. Um, at least scientists, like that's what we spend a lot of time trying to figure out. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something that, you know, I just, I just sit back and think about because when I, I think about, you know, misinformation and all that, I'm like, okay, let's, let's say I, we had a magic wand and we got rid of all the misinformation and just the best stuff came out, but still based on our identities and, you know, the polarization, would those people accept the truth? You know what I mean? And, and so like, so I like, when I think about that, I'm like, you know, is, is, you know, is that a step closer? Is there another route we should be taking and all that? And out of curiosity, as we're talking about this, are you familiar, or I don't know if you've read her book, uh, the work from uh, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, and she wrote that book, Biased? Yeah, I read yeah. it, great book. <laughs> yeah, it is, and it's it's interesting. I, I wanted to ask you, because whenever I hear these debates around like biases and racism and stuff, I literally, I never hear anybody bring up her work or if it's contested. Do you know if it's, if any of her research is contested at all? Like, I just don't hear about it. It seems like she had some of the most important work, especially when it comes to policing. So this is one thing that's actually incredibly frustrating for me is watching all the debates about policing and bias and not people not citing Jennifer Eberhardt's work. She's Thank been you. doing this for like 10 years and working closely with police forces in Oakland and other places. She's one of the leading scientists on this. She's a tenured professor at Stanford. Yeah, She's a black woman and in her book she talks about uh, when she was uh, confronted and she's a little woman and was manhandled by the police. But also in her book, she talks with an enormous amount of uh, perspective taking about what it's like to be a police officer and they're hearing things mm -hmm. over the radio all day. She's gone in and worked with them, talked to them. And so I'm just like, is, is, should there be a more urgent person in this conversation about policing and race than Jennifer Eberhardt in this country? Like very few people have actually done the work, been in police forces, have been on the other side of it as a minority woman. And, and her work is just woefully under-recognized. And actually we talk to her, she's, her book, I, I actually listened to the audio book. She has so much empathy and nuance and depth of understanding from personal experience and the like very rigorous science, that it, it is absolutely a tragedy that Jennifer Eberhardt's work is not read more and cited more and engaged with more around these issues. It's really, it, it's just, I, I shake my head. It's, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah, and, and thank you, Jay. Like I have felt insane for the last like year since I read her book. Like, I'm like, okay, well, well, maybe there's a ton of debate around her research. Maybe there's something shady going on because I never hear anybody talk about it, but I think I actually, heard about her book because she was on the daily show right, right. and then uh last year when uh you know all the blm protests like sparked up i started reading a ton of books and i was like this one has been on my list i'm going to read it but like you said i never see it cited and i've been meaning to reach out to her and you know have her on but if you ever come up with any ideas like i want to just put on there so funny quick story uh there's I, I don't know if you're familiar with his work but there's an author i think he's a professor too his name's gad sad and in his recent book he talks a lot about you know oh you know there's not really racism there's not really biases it's a bunch of snowflakes all these things and all that and in my review of his book i'm like it doesn't like you can criticize all these other ones, but I've noticed whenever people are criticizing some of the conversations around it, they never bring up Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt. But anyways, after I wrote that review, he yeah, it's me. you can't <laughs> if you're denying racism and not actually reading the research on it, then then you're not you have no arguments. Um, I mean, yeah. there's there's a reasonable argument about is racism the cause of all of these things? Yeah, you know, racism like this is the thing about social science. And my book's about identity, right? And we talk about how important identity is for all these different things from, from how you see things to whether or not you engage in a revolution to whether or not like how your beer tastes. Um, yeah. but, but what we I try to communicate, I don't know if we said it explicitly, but identity accounts for about 5% of the variance in all of those things. So identity affects a lot of things, but it's just a small chunk. Personality accounts for a huge chunk of behavior. Mm. Other aspects of the situation accounts for a huge chunk. Our biology in other ways accounts for a huge chunk. Um, and so, so we're talking about identity and, and it's a thing we study, but it's really only 5% of the story. And it's the same with things like racial bias or the IOT. You know, those things count for a few percent of the variance in people's behavior. And so I think people understandably get frustrated when 
they are hearing that that's 100% of the story. Well, clearly it's not. There's mm -hmm. all these other things. But to deny that it's part of the story is also utterly insane. Yeah. And so the, the challenge, the best research, this is what meta-analyses do, which is summarize you know, hundreds of studies, is they usually try to give you an estimate of how much variance is explained by this issue or this yeah. variable. And, and the history of social psychology, if you look over the last 100 years of meta-analyses, on average, it's about 5%. <laughs> for every yeah. whatever topic you're looking at, on average, it counts for about 5% of the variance. So that's why you know, some people think these things are understandably overstated. But to deny their existence is also just that science denial. It's like mm -hmm. denying that we put a man on the moon. You know, yeah. it, to me, that's insane. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, it's something that I try to bring up often when I talk about any of these types of issues, because I, uh, you know, I try to read, um, I try to read like the most extreme views from both sides, right? And then be like, oh, okay, well, what's in the middle, right? And, and just to see like, because like, for example, if I'm just talking politics, you know, somebody like Ben Shapiro, right? Or somebody like way, way over on the right, really panders to conservatives. I'm like, you're going to point out stuff that nobody on my side is talking about, right? So that's why I try to do it. But anyways, uh, what I've been noticing and try to talk about is, like, if you want to debate, like, the degree, that's something, you know? If you want to debate the degree, I'm all for it. But I, I, I feel, and I, I, I don't know if you've noticed this too, it seems like there's a lot of debate around the existence, yeah. right? And, and it's like, but... I don't know. And I don't know if this goes into like, you know, the, the moral conversations that get the most reach on social media, but those, those are the ones that get the most attention when people take a very black and white stance rather than, Hey, racism does exist. Because if you talk to people one-on-one, a hundred percent of the time, they'll be like, yeah, yeah. Racism exists. Right. But publicly that's not something that they talk about. And, and I try to figure out, is this a problem of people talking or us who are engaging with it. You know what I mean? Like, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I, this, is, this is where I think the black and white moralistic thinking is problematic for science discussions because the debate should be, if we're gonna talk about my work, we'll talk about, does do, do minimal groups increase bias by 5% of the variance or 4% of the variance, you know? Um, yeah. you know? Whereas like biology is accounting for it, the culture you're in accounts for part of it. Um, and, and so that's where the conversation should be. It shouldn't be whether or not it exists because at this point, there's a hundred studies on it. And, and that should be the same thing. Like when we're talking about, let's say like outcomes for undergraduate students in colleges, depending on their race, mm -hmm. there might be like the graduation rate for my, white students might be like, let's say 86% for black students, it's 80%. So that's a 6% gap. And then you can talk about how much racism accounts for that gap, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and of course it's gonna account for some of it, but other things might be accounting for it, including like poverty, um, so other structural factors that might not be about racial animosity per se that they face at, at a school level. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so these are the types of conversations that would be like a normal conversation to have. And then you can figure out how to fix it. So if you're figuring out like if they're facing a lot of racism from their professors, let's say, and there's some evidence that professors are racially biased in terms of how they respond to emails. There's great work by Dolly Chu and, and Katie Milkman mm -hmm. and uh, Madupe Akinola on they send professors a bunch of emails with different sounding names that were black, minority names or uh, white names and genders. And they found professors didn't respond as much to emails from students with these uh, minority sounding names. And so we know that that happens. The question is how much of that success, you know, in graduation rate for, for undergraduate students or job outcomes is that accounting for those types of barriers? Um, mm -hmm. And, and then, then we have to like educate professors about how to be more fair in their email responses or something. Um, and so that's why we need to know those things yeah. so we know what type of solution to have. But to deny they exist is just like, yeah. uh, again, it, to me, that's just science denial. It's not, it's not helpful at all. It distracts. And, and again, I think what's happening is those people will sell more books if they completely deny that racism exists. Um, you know, just like you'll sell more books and you'll get on Fox News if you deny yeah. that it is, exists. Yeah. Um, so it's really unfortunate in the United States, particularly, this doesn't happen as much in Canada, where I'm from. It, there's not as much polarization. So there's not as much of a economic incentive structure to misrepresent things or take absolute statements. I'm sure, I don't know how many books God sells in Canada, but that book probably sells better in the US where it kind of fits into this black and white cultural or type of dynamic. And then it gets in bookstores and sells many copies, but it's not really that informative. In fact, it's 
if it says yeah. I've read it, but if it actually actually says that, it's actively misleading people. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, that that brings up. Yeah, I want to ask you about one of the studies you guys talk about in the book, which, like, I think also says a lot. But but just real quick on on that topic, when it comes to books, right? Like, I thought Trump sucked as a president, right? But there's a thousand books on Trump, and like book after book, bestseller, bestseller bestseller and i'm like none of these have new information like i don't know like i'm a former drug addict jay okay like in 2012 i got i got sober but like i almost feel like confirmation bias is like a bigger hit of dopamine and we just get hooked on it. like yeah give me 300 more pages about how donald trump sucks like how is that expanding you but yeah that's my little rant about that because like you mentioned that that sells and i don't know I don't know what the solution is to that, Jay. So, so there's this thing we didn't talk about in our book, but maybe I'll talk about it here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it to me. Um, <laughs> I, I, Dominic and I call it identity grifting. And so there, there, there are some people who genuinely are true believers of these things. Yeah. But then there's other people who just see like a really lucrative market opportunity to make money. And and this happened, you know, in, in 2015 and before the, the previous presidential election where there's all this fake news coming out. And some of the fake news companies were producing negative fake news about Trump, but also negative fake news about Clinton. And they tracked some of them down. And these were just like guys living in Macedonia making six figures a year. And they didn't care who won, but they just knew publishing this bullshit would make them money because people would click on it and then they get advertising dollars. And so the problem with, and I think this is a problem with social media, and and some of the publishing industry is part of this, um, is that there are these incentive structures monetarily and ways to gain social status, even if you don't get money off it immediately, that are yoked to these types of identities. And you can exploit people by getting them to buy your product or your book. This is happening right now with kind of in the anti-vaxxer community. Some of these people are selling like these alternative products on yeah. their websites, these anti-vaxxers or podcasts. And so they're making money hand over fist and God knows if they generally believe this. Uh, so this is happening on Fox News. A lot of the main people are pushing kind of anti-vax messages. Privately, they all got vaccinated. And so this, this is one of these things where they're doing it because it, it's marketable. And this happens on the left too, that people market identity all the time. You can go into a lot of coffee shops in my neighborhood. I walk in and used to be you go to a coffee shop and say great coffee or great latte or whatever, whatever you're into. Um, now, if you walk in, it's just symbols of identity all over the place in the coffee shop about like how they're using the proceeds to help some certain group. Uh, um, yeah. You know, there, there's a coffee shop I went to in Providence called, I think it's called like Blue State Coffee, you know, and then <laughs> these places. And, and now on the right, there's, what is it? Black Rifle Coffee. There's these coffees that are essentially like the probably coffee is not that different between these places. What, yeah. what, what's marketable for them, what makes them a ton of money is that they're marketing an identity and selling it and making money from it. Yeah. And so that's kind of, I think, like what we have to recognize is that that we're 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 being sold identity from people, oftentimes mm -hmm. more than their genuine thoughts. And we eat it up because we're looking for the confirmation bias and and affirmations of our identity. Um, but they aren't necessarily the people who are selling it to us aren't necessarily true believers. Some are. Yeah. But a lot just see a market opportunity. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I just finished a, a book that talks a lot about this because something I, I think about and read about a lot is just signaling, right? Signaling what tribe we're with, what group we're with, and all that. And and you know, so some of this, like I buy this coffee, doesn't taste any different, doesn't do anything different, but it symbolizes this, right? Like hell, you you see, uh, what's his name, Mike Lindell, just having that pillow signals what side yeah. you're on and stuff and like we just do this constantly and it's oh, my pillow is that the guy what my pillow guy yeah yeah the my that that my pillow guy who's putting all his money into still trying to uh, <laughs> show that the election was a fraud or whatever but but they they feed they feed and profit off of anger and one of the studies that blew my mind and like i think you guys conducted this one correct me if i'm wrong and you just referenced it but it was the baseball fans and seating right because i think it's super important aside from the minimal group paradigm and something i learned from dr jennifer eberhardt's book is perception of threat and aggression so can you break that down a little bit this this kind of baseball study of opposing fans so this was done by led by one of my former phd students jenny mm. Shao. And um, we wanted to look at people who are threatened by their groups. And right now we're talking about pretty loaded groups, right? We're talking about race and policing. 
we're yeah. talking about politics. Um, but there's lots of other identities that people have in society. And it turns out these matter you know, more to most people most of the time. And one of them is their sports loyalties. And so I live in New York. I, I have to admit, I'm a Toronto Blue Jays fan because I'm from Canada. <laughs> and I, I was a kid when they won the, the World Series. And so there's research showing that it, as a kid, if the team in your you know, city or state or country mm. um, wins, when, if you're about 12 or 13 years old, it gets imprinted on you and you become a fan for life. That's, That's like the kind of like critical window if you're a little boy. Um, and so I was about that age when the Toronto Blue Jays won two World Series. So I'm like a stuck being a fan for life, even if they suck now. <laughs> um, but in New York, of course, it's the, the Yankees or the team. I mean, there's the Mets, but no one, no one will measure up to the Yankees. They've been dominant for so long. Yeah. And the biggest sports rivalry maybe in the whole country here is between the Yankees and the Red Sox. That dates back, you know, to Babe Ruth and over mm -hmm. 100 years old, that rivalry. And so we went up to Yankee Stadium, Jenny and, and our research team, and uh, she measured, had fans come pouring into Yankee Stadium, you know, the house that Ruth built, and asked them, you know, had them look at a map of the Northeast Coast and identify in the map where Fenway Park was, where Boston Red Sox, their, you know, arch rival played. And it was also at the time where they were in a playoff race with Boston mm. a few years ago, and they were number, you know, ranked number one and two in the division. And she also had the mark on a map where uh, the Baltimore Orioles are. And so Baltimore in Camden Yards, where they play, is almost the exact same distance apart to the south as Fenway Park is to the north of New York. So it really made a really good control condition. They're also in the same division as the Yankees, but they, I think at the time, were like 23 games back. They were in last mm. place. They're, they're historically a pretty terrible team. Um, and so people had to estimate how far away the arch rival Red Sox were and, and versus this terrible other outgroup that's non-threatening, which is the Baltimore Orioles. And the Yankees fans consistently thought that Fenway Park was closer to them than Camden Yards, you know, where the Red Sox were closer. Yeah. And whereas non-fans, so Yankee Stadium also is full of a lot of tourists who pass through New York in the summer. Um, and the tourists were accurate. They, they had the estimations much more accurate than Yankees fans did. And so Yankees fans, because they were threatened by Boston, their arch rival, had this distorted perception of this outgroup kind of looming closer to them. We also gave them a, another study where we had them look at the seating chart of all of Yankee Stadium, asked mm. them where they wanted Red Sox fans to sit if they came into the stadium for a game, and they wanted them all to sit in the nosebleed section. And we even had some people, we were shocked by this um, because we had a picture of the stadium on a blank piece of paper. Some of them wrote that Yank Red Sox fans should sit outside of the stadium. It should basically be banned from coming in. And they just, we were shocked because we didn't ask, we, you know, we thought they'd all mark inside the stadium. They just spontaneously wrote an area outside the stadium where Red Sox fans should sit. And they should yeah. also pay more for tickets, they said. And so this is like classic discrimination, right? Yeah. Uh, segregation, keeping out, out group members away and outside of society, charging them more for things. And, but in baseball, you know, it's, it's okay for people to express these prejudices. It's like one of those domains of society where we tell people it's okay to be prejudiced against yeah. the other team. Um, and so that was something that we, we, you know, found in our studies that matters just as much for these other identities. Yeah. And, and let me, let me tell you, I, uh, in my review of your book, uh, like I say this, like I, I read so much, but the way you two structured the chapters, like it was just, mwah. I loved it. <laughs> yes, right? yes. Because, yeah, because as as I read it, right, and like I just remembered like how much I love that because as you're talking about this with baseball teams, right, and we talk about the minimal group paradigm, you're listening, you're you're hearing about like the, this research around something so trivial as sports that you think somebody from the the opposing fan is closer to you, more threatening. They would have them sit outside the stadium, but then we're like, nah, man police officers could never be racist, right? They could never think, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, there's so many things like, of course, like, of course. And, and we need to, we need to recognize this stuff. But yeah, the way you guys built on it, like uh, for everybody who gets the book and reads it, I encourage them to do that. Like, like when I read these studies, I'm like, okay, what are the real world implications of this? What does this tell me about life and, and, and all of that? You know what I mean? Is that, is that something that you hope people do like with just with a variety of studies that you guys do? Yeah, so one thing we wanted to do is, you know, when you talk about these things just within the political domain, people get their back up. They get defensive because people are really invested in mm. politics. And, and so it's easy to want to deny things or rationalize them, or you only watch a certain news source. Um, and so we only have one chapter on politics in the whole book, right? Yeah. Most of it is about all different other types of identities, national identities, sports identities. And so we want 
people to understand that these are basic parts of human psychology that affect all kinds of ways in which we live our lives. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the, you know, in the very first chapter, we say, we, we quote Walt Whitman, the, the great New York poet. He says, um, we contain multitudes that I'm a sports fan just as much as I'm a son, just as much as I'm a New Yorker, just mm -hmm. as much as I'm a Canadian, just as much as I'm a father. These are all key parts of who I, who I am and they get triggered in different situations. Mm. And, and so what that means is that since we contain multitudes, um, it gives us some power to choose, you know, who do we want to be most of the time. Also, we get to choose a lot of times what groups we decide to identify yeah. with, what ones we decide to join. And then other ones that we're stuck with, you know, let's say you work, you can't, it's not sometimes easy to switch your job. But then we also try to tell people how norms work. So even if you're in a group, you get a say in, in, in how the norms of the group work, that you can cultivate dissent or creative thinking or anchoring the discussions on truth and facts and reality, not misinformation. And so we want to give people kind of the tools to understand, you know, we're, we, we are all these different identities. This is, tends to be how some of them go wrong, but mm -hmm. let's give you the tools to either opt into the right ones or to give you the tools to help fix the ones that you're in and to make them more accurate, to make them uh, more humane, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, so, so I, wanna, I wanna hopefully uh, lead into the end on a happy note and some optimism, right? Because here's the thing, as much as I love this stuff, as much as I love evolutionary psychology and being like, okay, this is like part of me, right? This stuff is like as much part of me as it is my hand. And you guys discuss uh, some of this uh, in the book, and you also have a ton of solutions towards the end or ideas for solutions. So one of the things I want to touch on real quick, there's so much debate and arguing around like companies, like, you know, especially during the uh, last summer, right? Everybody's like, okay, we need to do uh, implicit bias training. You guys all need to know about that. But you guys discuss evidence that some of this stuff, it doesn't stick. So my brain, and you know, maybe it's uh, the cynical, pessimistic side of me, I'm like, okay, this is a part of me, these biases. And here's what's nuts, Jay, real quick side note. I'm half black, so it freaks me out even more because I'm like, okay, am I partially racist because I look like, do I identify more than this? But anyways, like, what, where's the hope for this? Like, is this just part of us forever? Are we always gonna have these reactions to outgroup members? Like you've been studying this for like, you said like 20 years, has yours gotten better? You know what I mean? Like, what do, what do we do? What's the hope for humanity if we notice this and how do we make it stick? Yeah, so that's a, that is the question, I think. Um, yeah. So I think that there's two things you can do. One, by learning about it, you can critically reflect on it, understand how people are manipulating you so this, mm. this is one of my favorite books of all time is Bob Cialdini's book, Influence. Yep. And his whole book is all about, you remember how it's structured. Every chapter is, I got suckered into doing this dumb thing. I wanted to understand how it works so I would be yeah. in. And so we want people to understand who's manipulating you, how leaders manipulate you, propaganda manipulates you, the media manipulates you in ways that give you the tools to understand that. that or you know, when you're a victim of identity grifting, you buy this thing that's not any better, but because someone's like appealing your identity, you know, Understand that at least consciously you're just, that's what's happening to you. And if you want to resist it, then you can. Um, and then the next tool we want to give people is, and this is the, the kind of take on point from our, our chapter on discrimination and, and prejudice. Um, again, we only have one chapter on that, but the main message is there are two things. First of all, build more inclusive identities that we have capacities as a human to go up a level. We don't yeah. always have to be down here in our little tribal identities. We can move up to something that we both share and find common ground. Um, and then the other thing you want to do, if you make it stick, because it, people will always try to suck you back down to that competition, um, is to change a process. So most of discrimination, in my view, is actually structural and institutional. Um, we get stuck on these symbolic things or, or something somebody said. Um, and, and I understand why people get outraged by it. But what often causes more destruction is a system that's unfair. So let's say like an mm. algorithm used for hiring or, or medical recommendations. Yeah. Um, I recommend to people to think of what systems you have control over and try to fix them to be more fair mm -hmm. um, and unbiased. Because I think that that's where most of the harm is caused. And those are often the things that operate in the background. And, and what that also means is we live in the world where we're distracted. Our prefrontal cortex is constantly overloaded yeah. with stressful things in the world or like constantly getting like pinged from our iPhone, um, you know, or emails pouring in as we're trying to be in a meeting. And so we don't often have the capacity to regulate ourselves constantly, and check ourselves. And once you read our book, 
you know, you, you read it deeply, but a lot of people are just going to slip out of their mind and they're going to slip back into their old habits, you know, the next day. And so what we want people to do is walk away and change one system you're a part of and make it better. Mm. And if you can convince other people around you to do that, that's how you're going to affect things so that they're more fair and unbiased and non-discriminatory. And, and also this, I didn't cite this in my book, I don't think, but my uh, colleague at NYU, Mo Craig, has this great research showing that if you tell people they're prejudiced, they get defensive and yeah. they don't want to change. If you tell them they're racist, they really don't want to change. If you tell them a system that they control is racist, they're open to changing it. They're not mm. defensive. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. That's bad. I'm going yeah. to change it. And so I think the way a lot of our conversations go, unfortunately, online is about accusing each person of some kind of racial prejudice. And the reason people don't like the IAT, I think, the average person is because they don't want to be told that's them. That mm -hmm. it's, it's threatening to them. Uh, many people, unfortunately, to hear that, and they don't want the accusation or that taint attached to them and the yeah. shame and, that comes with it. Um, and so I think the, the more recent research is telling us there's better ways to go around it. And also, those ways are probably actually more effective in changing the world for, for better. And so yeah. that's how I would approach it is like, so tell someone, you might not be aware of this, but the way that you're doing this hiring process is unfair to this group because the way you wrote the job ad talks about hiring a rock star. And that just doesn't, you know, no women are going to apply to that job because they're yeah. kind of hearing like a dog whistle that that doesn't apply to them. Sounds like a, sounds like do, a dude wrote that, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so that's the type of thing that people might not be, are often very unaware of and often matters a lot. And most people are actually open-minded to changing once it's pointed out to them. So that's kind of where I would say most of the change can happen is think of a structure you can change. And, yeah. and, and think of convincing other people around you to change structures. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And, and you know, I, I only got like one more question for you, but like I... Uh, it makes me think of, you know, when you call the person a racist, like last summer, you know, when I read uh, Dr. Jennifer Eberhardt, I'm like, what's this book? What's this book, White Fragility, everybody keeps talking about? And I jump into it. I, I look at it. My main takeaway is what, what you just said. When you call someone out for something they're doing, they get defensive. Right. And I'm like, OK, that's the base of the book. Boom, put it away. Right. Then all of a sudden, I think I find out that people just hate Robin D'Angelo. I'm like, what am I missing? So her new book came out, Nice Racism. I read it, started looking around. I'm like, oh, right. And it seems like just like common sense, but it's it's what sells. Like you don't go around saying you're racist, you're racist. Nothing you could do can change. And it's like like I, I've worked with addicts for years. If I go up to a drug addict to say, hey, you're a drug addict. You're always going to be a drug addict. You're never going to be anything but a drug addict. You know what they're going to say? Well, I'm just going to keep doing drugs because I'm, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so it's, it's the way the message is given, but it sucks because like you said, we're being manipulated to feed into that, you know? Um, but, but what I try one, other, one other thing that yeah. you said that's really important. And this is also a great book. If you hadn't read it by Anthony Akia, he's a philosopher. Ooh, um, he has a book called the lies that bind. And the point of his whole book is that when the way we talk about identity is that we attach an essentialistic element, like you're a racist, that's part of who you are deep down. Uh, we also attach it to religion, you know, you're a Muslim, you're a Jew. Um, we attach it to national identities, you're a Canadian, you're an American. Um, and the way we talk about it is if it's this essentialistic thing that's attached to you, like biologically, that you can never escape. Mm. Uh, if we want to get, have real conversations about people, make them more open-minded, we got to do the opposite. We got to get rid of essentialistic language and use what, what uh, you know, Josh Aronson and Carol Dweck and others in our field call a uh, growth mindset. Yeah. Talk about people as if they're, we're all on a journey of growing and learning. Every time you read a book, you know, you're this voracious reader, you learn something and you walk with a new lesson. Every time I run a study, it's the same. Every time I make a mistake in a relationship, hopefully I can learn from it. And so we wanna treat these as opportunities for people to grow and everybody's on a different path along this, this journey. And if someone's earlier in the path than you, I, I really worry about excoriating them because I've been on my own pathway and I remember being at an early stage of enlightenment about a lot of things. Yeah. You know, I would have hated to have been ostracized for that. I was grateful at each stage that people pulled me along the path a little bit further and made me aware of things and helped me grow and gave me the opportunity to go and treat me as if I was capable of growth. Yeah. Um, and so whether you're talking about the stigma of people who use drugs, you know, you're here because you saw yeah. an opportunity to grow past your addiction. I hope that other people can grow, whether it's politically or around factual information or around racism. And, and so a, a good book on this and a good person who hammers this home is Dolly Chu's colleague of mine at NYU is, um, and she really has a, a, a newsletter and a book around good people that a lot of us are trying to be better. We're trying to be good people. 
and 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 her book's all about just trying to help you get a step further along that road yeah 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 absolutely i wouldn't be here i wouldn't have my son back in my life and you know we we hang out and you know i'm a i'm a i'm a father i'm a son i'm a friend i wouldn't be here if people didn't just give me that opportunity to grow That's you know an awesome story i also just i think it's really i just want to give you credit for sharing that story it really you're making yourself vulnerable you're being authentic and and when other people are struggling through some of these things hear that from you and see where you've come it shows them maybe they can do it maybe they can get back in a relationship with their son mm -hmm. maybe they can overcome drugs or other things um so i also think that's an important thing as we show our vulnerabilities and our growth so that other people can see that's a, a potential pathway for them yeah yeah something i i i, I think about and why i like to read and you know read books like yours and so many is just changing my beliefs like saved my life you know and and it's that's kind of the core of why i read so much and try to learn about growth and all that but la last question for you speaking of me and what i read so i i'm a i'm a yeah like i said i'm a former drug addict college dropout just a guy who likes to read and learn i read your book right and i'm i'm wondering because i hope everybody who's listening to this understands how important your book is and i'm like who who do you and dominic hope reads this book book right because like i look around and i see the people talking about it on twitter seems like other researchers and professors and it's like okay cool cool i hope you guys read it so you can teach people awesome but i want to like give it to like high school students and college students and i want to give it to employers and all these other people so i'm just curious if you had in mind like if if you had one wish who would read this book to understand better about our how identity plays in all this that's a, a fantastic question so our book right now because it's in an area that a lot of researchers read and most people who probably follow me on social media are, are researchers. A lot of them actually probably know some of the stuff. They probably know at least a third or half of it, if not most of it. Um, and I'm really grateful that they like it because it means that if serious researchers think it's good, yeah. we give the science justice. Um, but really who we wrote it for is people outside of science because the, the work on social identity is published in 10,000 articles. It's in a thousand academic books. Um, but no, no one outside of academia has actually read those books. And so what we want people to read it is people like yourself, who are just curious uh, people who want to learn. And we wrote it in a way that the stories would mm -hmm. make it come to life and that would stick home. We tried to summarize the research in a very simple way, as if you're reading the newspaper. We want it to be for the average person who just reads a blog or reads a newspaper or, or listens to a podcast. It's like, Actually, a smart podcast listener is almost our ideal audience. It's like mm -hmm. someone who listens to your podcast, somebody who cares about science and learning is doing it on their free time. This is not something that they're required to do in school or for their work. And they just want to enrich their life and get smarter because they could be like listening to like serial podcasts about like, you know, murder mysteries and stuff like yeah. that, right? They're listening to your podcast because they want, they're intrinsically motivated to get smarter and wiser about the world and about themselves. That's actually our target reader. And so yeah. it goes those type of people pick it up and read it and just walk away a little bit smarter. And it could be about how they run, how they manage their daughter's soccer team. And mm. if they get better at that, then we, it's a win for us. I just want our, every reader to use it, it to make a group that they're part of get better, whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And aside from this, this episode, if there's anything I could do to help accomplish that goal, you let me know. Cause I come across books and I'm like, this is important. You need to read it. I have like a, a list of books where it's like when my son, he's only 12 right now. When he gets a little bit older, it's like, here's all the books that you have to read. But, I mean, but yeah, I mean anyway. that my son's 11 and a half. So he's uh, almost ready for that list too. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll make a, a group list. Maybe I'll post That's it on the a great, blog. That'd be a great post for you. Books yeah. that like uh, teenagers need to read. That'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yeah, so we're recording this a little bit before the book comes out. But by the time to post, the book will be out. But can you let everybody know when it's out, where it's available, and where they can find you and Dominic, because you guys are, are researching and talking, and like you guys are very active on social media and stuff. So where can people find both of you as well as the book? Oh, I got a book. It is. So here's the title, The Power of Us. Um, it comes out September 7th. And we have a website called powerofus.online. And you mm. can go there and uh, sign up to our newsletter. You can buy the book anywhere. So you know, it's available wherever books are sold. It'll be sold, you know, whether it's Amazon, if you don't like that, you can go to Target. Independent booksellers will have mm. it. Um, and you can get it on Audible. We re even recorded a personal preface. The story opens with me choking and Dominic saving yeah, my life. Yeah, I so enjoyed that. <laughs> you wanna, yeah, so that we recorded that ourselves and the rest is on audio if you like to listen to audio books like I do. Um, and we are also available, if you go to our website, it's links to all our social media. 
and you can follow us and engage with us uh, online. We look forward to as many readers joining uh, our community as possible, being part of our team. Beautiful. And by, by the way, last thing I'm going to say, and I want everybody to hear, so, so hopefully we can uh, peer press you into doing it. I need that book, Identity Grifting. I need just an entire book on it. Okay, I think that, that, I'll, I'll pitch that to my agent. Maybe that'll be the next one. I think that that's, uh, that'll be controversial, but I think that'd be a funner book to read. Yeah, I, w- I would love it. I'll be an early reader. But yeah, <laughs> thank you so much for your time, Jay. And and yeah, it's it's been a pleasure. We'll have to do this again sometime. Okay, thanks so much. It was an uh, honor to be on the show.